good to be back in your presence this morning. I just want to say I'm ready to go to work on this. Amen. Amen. I've been praying, I've been studying, and, and the Lord has shared some things with me, and I'm just chomping at the bit to share them with you. Amen. So I want you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, in chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want you to say amen when you're there. I've been studying and reading about David this week. King David. And I've been, as I was studying and, and, and meditating upon the word of God concerning David. It came to my remembrance some of the things that David faced in his lifetime. He had many, many troubles, many, many trials, many circumstances that were continually coming against David. And I know today, especially after listening to our prayer request, that there are those of you that are here and you've got your problems. Amen. You've, you've got your troubles. You've got things that are coming against you or maybe against a loved one. I just love the way that the, that the Lord works everything together from the songs that we sing to the testimonies that we hear to the prayer requests that come out. I can't explain what it is that I'm that I'm trying to say, but if, if you were ever to be able to step into my shoes and have been studying throughout the course of the week and praying and seeking the face of the Lord and then to show up here at church and to see the Holy Spirit just line everything up. Amen. It's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I'm glad today to know that we have the Holy Spirit. And I'm glad today to know that the Holy Spirit is no longer on us as a People, but now the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. Right. We don't only have the Spirit on us, we have the Spirit in us. And that's going to be a, a, a key point in the message today. So I want you to hang on to that thought. David had his problems, much like we do. David had his troubles, much like we do. David had things that came against him, much like we do. David was betrayed by friends. Betrayed by famine. King Saul wanted to kill him. At one point in time, Saul threw a spear at him to try to, try to kill David. There were those that loved him. There were those that hated him. And even in his own family, he faced struggles and trials and problems and circumstances. David fought many, many battles. And if you take the time to read about the life of David, you're going to see one battle after another after another that David had to stand and fight. Sometimes he had to stand and fight alone. There were times when people were singing his praises because of the victories. And then there were times when the same people who had earlier sung his praises were ready to stone him to death. And it made me think about how life really is. And how many times people will say, I just absolutely love you. And then the next time you see them, they're ripping you to pieces. David understood about that. Maybe the greatest thing that David is remembered for or known for is the fact that David faced his giants. We all know the story of David and Goliath. How that Goliath was defying the very armies of God. And all of the fighting men of Israel were afraid to death for this massive giant. And one day, David showed up. And he's just a little fellow, a young boy. His big brothers, whom he looked up to, thought he was tough. He showed up to give them some bread and some cheese and found his big brothers shaking and trembling in fear because Goliath was standing and defying everyone. Send me a man from among you. And all of the fighting men of Israel stood and trembled and shook. And as David is looking around and he sees what's taking place here, he asks the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of God? His older brothers were telling him, you be 
quiet there. But David was refusing to be quiet. And you can almost hear the conversation when you think you're so tough, David, why don't you go out and face it? Okay, I will. Sit down and eat your cheese. That giant will kill you. How many times do we hear in our lives, sit down and eat your cheese, that giant is too big? But David was moved by something different than the rest were. David was being moved by faith while the others were being moved by fear. David understood that this wasn't his battle, it was God's. And so when they tried to dress him up with their armor, when they tried to put the king's armor on him, the helmet was too big, and the breastplate was too big, and the sword, the little boy couldn't even lift it up. He said, this ain't going to work. I've not proved these things. There's a message in that. We need to operate in what we've proved. So he took those things off, and with five smooth stones and a slingshot, David went and faced his giant. And as the giant taunted him, and as the giant called out to him, and as the giant made his threats toward David, David wasn't moved with fear, but David was moved with faith, and he reached into his bag, and he pulled out one of those stones, and he slung it, and the stone hit the giant right in the head. You, you've read this scripture, and I've preached it to you hundreds of times. And the giant fell. And we all think that that little rock from the slingshot is what killed Goliath, but you need to go back and read it. It's in, it's in 1 Samuel as well, chapter 17. It wasn't the little stone that killed the giant Goliath. David went and pulled Goliath's own sword and used it to slay that giant. And that tells me the very things that our enemy is using to try to destroy us are the very things that God can use in His hand to claim victory in our lives. When we're able to turn that fear into faith, when we're able to face our giants, then we'll see bigger and greater victories. And certainly, David knew a little bit about that, but what we need to come to understand is that David that fought Goliath in chapter 17 was victorious for a few reasons that we see in chapter 16. And can I tell you, every one of you in this church this morning has a chapter 16 in your life. Right. I want to say that again because it's profound and you need to hear it. Every one of you that is here today has a chapter 16 in your life. Something that God did that you didn't even realize He was doing that has put something on the inside of you that's going to give you the victory when the, at last you face your chapter 17. Because maybe you haven't faced your chapter 17 yet. Make no mistake, chapter 17 is coming. Say it with me, chapter 17 is coming. Chapter 17 is coming. Amen. So knowing that chapter 17 is coming in your life, you need to get a good hold on what happened in chapter 16. Not just for David. Amen, but for Mark, and for Ruth, and for Tim, and for Richard. We need to understand what God did in the previous chapters of our lives that sets us up for victory in the future chapters of our lives. Yes. And the greatest thing that He did was sending us His Son, Jesus Christ, to bleed and die on an old rugged cross that we might obtain salvation. Somebody shout Amen. 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 He left His home in glory to bleed and die Man's greatest need is not for better education. Man's greatest need is not for a growth in knowledge. Man's greatest need is for the forgiveness of sin that has separated us from the fellowship of the God who loves us and created us. Amen. And Jesus Christ is that answer. And He left His home in glory to bleed and die on an old rugged cross that we might have that forgiveness of sin. He resurrected on the third and appointed day so that we might have that hope of eternal life. And as I told you earlier, Jesus told His 
disciples, it's expedient for you that I go. Because if I don't go, then I can't send the Spirit. <laughs> so we know that He did go. And we know that He did send the Spirit. And so every man, woman, boy, and girl who repents of their sins, asks Jesus Christ for forgiveness, and invites Him in to be their Lord and their Savior, something happens on the point of salvation. It's called the infilling, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. And if you ever wondered where we get the power to say no to sin and yes to Jesus, to say no to the devil and yes to God, we get that power through the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Amen. They're preaching and teaching all kinds of foolishness today when it comes to the Holy Spirit of God. That's why you need to have a solid prayer life and to be able to read the Holy Scripture for yourself and come to find out that Jesus, the Bible says He came unto His own and His own received Him not, but to His the sons of God. Yes. Amen. Amen. Power, to, power to live a righteous life. Power to say no to sin. Power to say yes to Jesus. Power to face things in your life that you never thought you'd be able to face. Mm. There's great, great healing and deliverance if you would allow your heart to meditate upon the power that God has given you. That all happened to you back in chapter 16. <laughs> Read with me, if you will. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, saying, I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So the word went out to the old prophet. Go over to Jesse's house. Jesse's got some sons. I've rejected Saul, and I'm going to anoint a new king. And that king is going to come from the house of Jesse. Samuel, go to Jesse's house. And I'm going to show you the one that I have chosen. Say this with me. God chose. God chose. Amen. Keep that in the back of your mind. He says, I'm going to show you the one that I have chosen to be king over Israel. And Samuel said, I'm at verse 2, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul here, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. How many of you come to understand that God absolutely has a plan for your life? Amen? And God has a purpose for your life. And I preach this all the time. God also has a process. Amen. And right now there's a process that's taking place. Saul, wicked Saul, has been rejected by God and is no longer going to be the king or the leader over God's people. And God is about to choose the next king. Verse number four. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peacefully? And he said, Peacefully. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. I wonder this morning how many of us have, been, have gotten sanctified to come into the house of the Lord today for worship. I wonder today how many of us have set aside time throughout the course of this week to meditate upon the goodness of God and who He is. Right. I wonder today how many of us have set aside some time in this previous week to, read, to have read something from the Scripture and allow God to speak to your heart. I wonder today as we gather together how many of us have set aside a little bit of time in this previous week to have sought the face of God in prayer just to listen to His voice and to receive His leadership and His guidance. Have we sanctified us? We have come, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there I will be in the midst of them. Folks, we need to sanctify ourselves to come into the presence of a holy God. Right. Man, there's a message in that, Brother Richard. Amen. Lord, keep me focused. If I take off on that, I'll never get to the message. Verse number 6 says, And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked upon Eliab. 
And he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not unto his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And I would love to say to those who merely have religion and don't have Jesus Christ, you can look good on the outside, but your inside can be dirty. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, and he said, you do well to clean up the outside of the cup and the outside of the platter. Amen? But the inside of the cup is dirty. He said, you need to clean up the inside of the cup, and then the outside will naturally be clean. I believe that we have so many people in our world today that are serving religion and not serving Jesus Christ. I believe that we have so many people today who are trusting in their religion, but not trusting in the blood of the Holy Lamb of God. Today, we need to lose our religion and just get Jesus Christ. Right. Mm. Oh, yeah. Then Jesse called Abinadab and said unto him, Pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be in that place that day? To have the old prophet show up at your house. Brother David, to have the old prophet show up at your house and say, I'm gonna, God's going to choose one of your sons today. He's going to be the new king. I, before I leave, I'm going to anoint one of your boys. Go get them. And to pray them in front of him, one after another, after another, after another, seven times. Just to hear the old prophet say, it ain't none of these. <laughs> well, uh, this is my eldest son. Uh, and he's a good looking boy, don't you think? Yeah, but God Come with me. 
Hmm. I'm telling you, David is facing things that a lot of us have had to face in our lifetime. Surely David's not going to be the king. He's too young. Can I tell you, younger folks that are in here, don't ever let anybody make you feel like you don't have anything to offer because you're young. Jesus, at 12 years old, was preaching and teaching in the temple so powerful that he was astonishing the quote-unquote preachers and teachers. Because he had such knowledge and he spoke with such power. You're never too young to do something for God. And you're never too old to do something for God. Don't bother with David. He's just out there taking care of the sheep. He's not a warrior. He's not a fighter. He's really not all that good looking. He's too young and what's he know? He's out feeding a bunch of sheep. Can I tell you something? This world just looks to the wise things, but God chooses the foolish things of this world wise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not this boy. Not this boy. Not this boy. No, not that one. Uh-uh. No way. And it happened seven times. And Samuel's, I don't understand what's going on here, Jesse. I know. I know what the Lord told me to do. And he specifically said, come to your house. And you presented to me all your sons. But God has rejected all. Are you sure that you brought to me all of your children? Well, Samuel, I've still got one more boy, but you don't understand. He's, he's the runt of the litter. He's, he's the youngest one, and he's out taking care of the sheep. Hmm. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I'm still in verse 11, and Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he cometh hither. Hmm. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. In other words, he was red faced, his cheeks were blushed. And with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to, and the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. You see what his father saw, and what his brother saw, and what his neighbor saw was a little boy. But what God saw was a man after his own heart. <laughs> What everybody else saw was a ruddy little child that was out in the back 40 taking care of sheep. What God saw was the future king of Israel. Mm. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I want to point out just a few things to you this, this morning, if I can, if you allow me a few more min minutes in time, as we take a look at the, at the story of David, and we know what David faced, and we know what David accomplished. We know that he struggled with sin, and we know that he fell on his face before the Lord and repented. Maybe somebody listening to me today, you're struggling with sin in your life. And what you need to do is follow the example of David and fall on your face and repent before God. Maybe some of you are taking and, and paying attention to the life of David and you come to see that David faced his giants. He didn't only face Goliath, but David faced all of Goliath's brothers. It wasn't just one giant that David had to face. David faced many giants and David slew many giants. Goliath is just the one that gets all the notoriety. But he faced every, every brother that Goliath had. Right. And the same way that he defeated Goliath, he defeated Goliath's brothers. So maybe today, maybe today you've got sin in your life and you're thinking, what am I going to do about this? It's huge. It's got a hold. I wish I could go back to where I started and just, listen, you can't go back, but you can go forward. And you can do what David did and fall on your face before the Lord and repent and say, God, this Forgive me and set me free from this 
thing and give me power and he'll hear your prayer. His mercies are made new every day. Maybe you're here today and you're facing your own giants and you're paying attention to who David really is and you're thinking the Holy Spirit is starting to well up inside you and you're hearing God speak to you and tell you if David can do it, you can do it. Amen, but you're thinking, I don't know, this is pretty big. I don't know. Do you know bankruptcy is a Goliath? Do you know health issues is a Goliath? Do you know a sick grandfather is a Goliath? Do you know brokenness in your home is a Goliath? Do you know grief is a Goliath? We face Goliath so many times, and I think sometimes we don't even know we're facing a Goliath. When something, listen, when something seems too big for you to handle, it's a Goliath. And instead of looking about how big your Goliath is, start looking about how big your God is. Amen. 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 So maybe you're here today, and maybe, maybe you're facing a Goliath of your own. I want you to know that God's got power to give you victory. And so what we need to come to understand as we take a look at the story of David and everything that David accomplished, one, there's a, there's a verse of scripture that's, that's known about David that says, and David went on, and David grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. And we think, man, I wish I could be like David. Can I tell you something? The only reason David had a chapter 17 and forward is because he first had a chapter 16. And every one of you had a chapter 16. Whether you're here saved, whether you're here lost, you've got a chapter 16. And I want to share some things with you, and then we're going to close. The first thing that I want to share with you is I want you to pay attention to verse number 12. Verse number 12 in chapter 16 says this. And he sent and brought him in. Who? David. Okay, Samuel told Jesse, this can't be all of your children. Jesse said, there's still one left. His name is David. He's out in the field. He's the youngest one. He's not the one you're going to want. Uh, Samuel said, go send for him. And so they sent for David, and David come before him. And here is what verse number 12 says. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, get this, highlight it, circle it, underline it, do something. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. All of the others passed before him and God said no. One time, no. Two times, no. Three times, no. Four, five, six. All the way up to seven. Seven of Jesse's sons passed before Samuel and God said, no, this is not my choice. But when David came before Samuel, God said, this is he. In other words, God said, this is the one that I have chosen. Mm. Can I tell you today, John chapter 15 and verse 16 in the King James says, Jesus is saying to his disciples, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it. If you're here today and you're in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is in you, you have been chosen, handpicked by the Master's hand. So, out of my father's hands. 
we sing the song Blessed Assurance. Do we just know the words? Or do we know the blessed assurance? We are picked. Handpicked and chosen by God. Mm. Another scripture in 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Elect is another word for the chosen. Mm. Don't that just bless you? You know, I've taught it this way before, and I want to spend just a couple of minutes to, to, to kind of refresh us and bring us back to the lesson. When, 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 when you and your spouse are getting ready to have a child, nowadays, nowadays you can you can know what the what the child is going to be. They even have gender reveal parties. But there was a point in time when you didn't know what you were going to have. You just had to wait until you had it. You didn't know if it was going to be a boy or if it was going to be a girl. Today, you can know beforehand and you can either paint the nursery pink or you can paint the nursery blue. But back there was a day when you just held off on the paint until the baby was born. Because you didn't know what you were going to get. You didn't know it was going to be a boy. You didn't know it was going to be a girl. You didn't know if it was going to be cute. Anytime, I need to slow down, calm down for a minute. 
this is a very point, point, important <laughs> point. That was easier thought about than said. It's a very important point in the message today. If you're in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is in any time, any time in the scripture, you're reading about the anointing of oil. It is symbolism of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Before David was God's choice, David knew nothing of the anointing of God. The anointing of God was not on David until David was actually chosen by God. But once David was chosen by God, the commandment went out to anoint him. And when we read in the scripture about the anointing of oil, we are actually reading about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so when David was chosen by God, the very next step was the anointing of the Holy Spirit fell upon him. How many of you know that you are walking in the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God? Oh my goodness, if you get a hold of this, it would send revival into your heart. <laughs>
Even when there's trouble in my life, even when there's trouble in my life. Even when my heart is broken, even when your heart is broken. Even when I'm praying for my grandpa, even when you're praying for your grandpa. Even when the home is divided, even when the job says you're done, even, even in the midst of a bankruptcy court, no matter where you're at, no matter what is happening, when you face your giants, you're not facing them alone because you've not only been anointed with the Spirit of God, but you've got the Spirit of God. And having the Spirit of God on the inside of you means you're never out of the presence of God. Mm -hmm. right. That's powerful. I'm trying to feed you some really good stuff here this morning. Because I believe the time is coming when we're going to have to lean on our chapter 16. Mm -hmm. I do. I believe there's giants coming. I believe that we are about to see one of the greatest revivals that this nation has ever saw. But before the revival, there's going to be a battle. Amen. And we are going to have to settle down on some old-fashioned, fundamental, biblical teachings and start leaving some of this foolishness alone that has infiltrated our church world over the last 20 and 30 years. Mm -hmm. You may never in your life see me jump off of this pulpit and walk across the top of the pews. That doesn't mean I don't have the Holy Spirit. Right. But you will hear me declare to you the truth of God's Word and challenge you to read it with me. And I'm going to do it in power and I'm going to do it in passion and I'm going to do it in just a sign to you that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. You may never hear me prophesy of great things, but you will hear me declare what's already been prophesied. You may never hear me take off speaking in an unknown term. It doesn't mean I don't have the Holy Spirit. We need to start setting down on some old-fashioned, fundamental, biblical teaching because, hear me today, I believe there is a revival that's coming, but before the revival, there's some giants that we're going to have to face. Amen. Giants of fear, giants of frustration, giants of anguish, giants of heartache, giants of impatience, giants of all different kinds that are going to move against the church world like you've never seen. But David had a chapter 16, and because of chapter 16, David knew that he was a chosen vessel of God. David knew that he had the power of the anointing on his life. And David knew that he was constantly in the presence of God because he had the Holy Spirit. And so whenever a giant raised its ugly head, or whenever there was problems in the home, or whenever there was a king that was trying to kill him, or a son that was trying to betray him, David was able to do what David needed to do because David was operating in a chapter 16. Can I tell you something today? You're able to do what you need to do. Ah, oh, preacher, you don't know. You, you don't know what I'm facing. You don't know what I'm going through. I, you're right. Maybe I don't know what you're facing. Maybe I don't know what you're going through. And I'll pray for you, and I'll be here to help you every step of the way. But I don't want you to tuck your tail like some stray dog. And with your head tucked down and running down the alley, hoping nobody sees you, get your tail off from underneath your legs. Hold your head up high and start barking. Hear me today. You are a child of God. You've been chosen. You have a chapter 16. And I'm going to remind you of it every time I see you shed a tear, every time I see fear fall upon you, every time I see heartbreak, every time I see anguish, every time I see confusion, every time I see something in you that's not coming from the hand of our God, I'm going to remind you, you've got a chapter 16. You've been chosen. You've been anointed. And you're in the presence of God. And victory is yours. We used to sing it on the Amen. Amen. Same old song down at the old home church. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. You can sing that song because you've got a chapter 16. Ain't that right? Praise His holy name. I wonder today how many of you are facing many troubles. Praying for a wayward son or daughter. Praying for some peace. Needing some patience. You're confused. You need some guidance in your life. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I wonder how many of you today 
have ever felt the sting of betrayal, betrayed by friends, betrayed by families, betrayed by a mom or a dad, betrayed by a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife. Those wounds go deep. But I know God that goes deeper. Mm -hmm. I wonder today how many of you, how many of you have had to fight your battles only to wake up again today with another one in front of you? Can I tell you today? You can have victory. Because you've been chosen. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, yeah, preacher, but I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm not that girl. I'm, I'm not that woman. I know the gospel. I know that Jesus is real. I know that He's able to save and to forgive. But I've never, I've never humbled myself before Him. And surrendered myself to him and just said, Forgive me of my sins and make me one of your own and save my soul. Fill me with that spirit. Let me be one of yours. Maybe, maybe today you're saying, Preacher, I, I want to be that one that's chosen. I want to be that one that's in my I want to be that one that's filled with the spirit. You can do that. All you got to do is just repent of your sins. Invite Jesus Christ into your heart and ask Him to forgive you. Maybe you're here today <laughs> and you've done that. But the back is, hey, get your eye off your Goliath. Put it back on your God. Mm -hmm. And know that you're chosen and that you're anointed mm -hmm. and that you're forever in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm preaching on message. Let's try to start. You can pray from your seat if that's what you'd like to do. If you feel the call to kneel down to our altars, I want you to know they are always with And I wonder today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's one or more in our midst today. And as a preacher, you know, I'm the one that knows. I'm the one that believes, but I've done nothing with what I know and what I believe. I've been trusting in my religion, and I need to trust in Jesus Christ. I've been trusting in my own abilities. I need to trust in Jesus Christ. I've often told myself one of these days when I get older and I've done all that I want to do, then I'll receive Jesus Christ and be saved. Friend, it will work that way. If the Holy Spirit's strong and calling you now, now is the time for you to receive Jesus Christ. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. There's no one can see you right now. Just me and the Holy Spirit of God is more and more of you here today and say, Preacher, that's me. I want to repent of my sins. I want to ask the Lord to forgive me and to save me. I'm not going to pull you up here in front of all these people and make some big ado. I just want to lead you in prayer. I see that hand. Amen. Is there another? Praise the Holy Spirit. I see another. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Could there be another? Amen. For the two that is, for the two that is said, preacher, that's me. Listen. Listen, I can lead you to Jesus Christ, but you're going to have to do the praying in your own way. Just open your heart to Him and say, Lord God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that He died in my place to pay a ransom for my sin. <clears throat> I come today believing and I repent turn from my sins. I turn from my wicked ways. I ask you that you'd forgive me. I ask that you'd save me. <coughs> Fill me with your spirit. And guide me the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, for the two that found me alive today. My heart is filled with joy right now. But maybe today, Lord, maybe today, as the church now has bowed their heads before you. And Lord, they've, they've got their troubles and their struggles and their trials and their giants in their land. Maybe there's one or more of them that are here today that would have me pray for them. 
to remember them because now they've been reminded how many times God had chosen been anointed and I'm filled. I see you and I see you and I see you and I see you. Now thank you Lord. Father, as I pray for this church and for all of those that have just raised a hand, nearly every hand in this place, Father. I just pray today, Lord, for this truth to remain forever in their hearts. Lord, give them the victory. Rebuke the enemy and cause him to flee. I pray today, Lord, that you'd speak to the hearts of their wayward sons and daughters and draw them by your Holy Spirit to a place of repentance where they too might be saved and restored. I pray today, Lord, for the healing of those, for, for Kaylee's grandfather today, Lord, we just lift him up. And, and Lord, for those who have had broken hearts because they've had to say goodbye to love, whatever the need might be, whatever the prayer is today, Lord, I stand in a gap on behalf of each and every one of them. And I'll ask you, Lord, to hear their prayers and to answer according to your will and to your purpose. And Father, give us that victory. Help us to know forevermore and never forget we all have a chapter 16. And that chapter 16 gives us hope and gives us, gives us the expectancy of victory in our lives. Father, I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too. So I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, to please keep them all safe from harm's way. Bring us back in our next appointed time and once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we give to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.